right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, marketing specialist, and I will be your moderator. This is part three of our six-part webinar series focusing on treating patients with disabilities. If you happen to miss either part one or two of this series and you would like to watch them, please email webinars at henryshine.com and we will send you the recordings. We are excited to welcome back Dr. Maureen Perry as our speaker tonight, as she will discuss dental management of patients with cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular disorders. Dr. Perry is the professor of special care dentistry and the director of the Center of, the Center of Advanced Oral Health at the Arizona School of Dentistry. In addition, Dr. Perry is a fellow of the Academy of Dentistry for Persons with Disabilities and is a diplomat of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry. Before we get started, we have a few reminders for you. At any point during tonight's webinar, we highly encourage your participation through the chat and Q&A features. Please type any questions you might have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. And directly following today's webinar, we are asking that you complete a quick survey to let us know what you thought of the presentation. If you elected to receive CE credit for this webinar, it is required that you complete that survey in order to get your CE certificate. It's also required that you attend this webinar for the entire duration. Your CE certificate will then be emailed to you, will be emailed to the email address provided during registration and your account will be billed then. Henry Schein is only able to offer CE credits to doctors licensed and practicing in the United States. Dr. Perry, thank you for joining us tonight. We're looking forward to another enlightening presentation. Thanks, Adam. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the dental management of patients with cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular disorders. So here is our um, SERP disclaimer or claimer that you can get CE if you signed up for it. Um, and here is my disclosure that I've been compensated by Henry Schein for conducting these continuing education uh, sessions and that these are my opinions and not those of Henry Schein. Learning objectives. We are going to be able to describe the implications for dental care for patients with neuromuscular disorders, define cerebral palsy, and describe common types of neuromuscular disorders. And really tonight we're going to focus on cerebral palsy and uh, muscular dystrophy as they're the most common types of neuromuscular disorders that we see in dental practice. Uh, again, dental care is the most prevalent unmet health care need for all children with special care uh, health care needs, and that goes along also for uh, adults. When we think about um, developmental disability, that's the core, right? So anybody can have a developmental disability. It has to happen before you turn 21. And the big four developmental disabilities are intellectual disability, autism, epilepsy, and what we're going to talk about a lot tonight, uh, cerebral palsy. And that is one of the things to, to consider that you may have cerebral palsy and you might have one or more of the other constellation of developmental disabilities. So neuromuscular disorders. What we see in neuromuscular disorders largely are malocclusions, anterior open bite, constricted uh, maxilla. Um, and we see a lot of that secondary hypotonia. There's a lot of persistent drooling, right? We call that sialuria. And we also see airway compromise in these patients. So what is CP? Uh, it's a chronic disorder of movement and coordination, and it's caused by injury to the immature brain, and it either happens uh, prenatally or perinatally. And the encephalopathy itself is static. In other words, the lesion doesn't change in the brain, the area that's affected. Um, it doesn't change or enlarge, but pa patients might do better or worse based on uh, multiple therapies, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little while. What are the causes of CP? So you could have congenital CP, which happens before birth or during birth or within the first 28 days of life. After that, we would call it acquired CP. And that's usually acquired in the first year of a child's life when the brain is still developing. And usually that's caused by such infections like meningitis or it could be caused by a head injury. CP can, is classified according to the kind of di movement disorder that's involved. So spastic is when you have kind of those jerky movements. Um, the patients are very stiff uh, they have, because their muscle tone is very, very high. When you have low muscle tone, the patient is loose and they kind of have slow writhing movements, uh, but they're still uncontrolled. And we call that dyskinetic or athetoid. And then we have the third kind, which is the rarest kind called ataxic, and that affects balance and perception. And people can have a mixed type as well. 
Uh, and then we also classify it according to, is it hemiplegia, diplegia, paraplegia, quadriplegia, or monoplegia, which is very rare. We mostly see uh, hemiplegia or, um, and paraplegia, um, and sometimes quadriplegia, but mostly we see the first two. What's the incidence of, of uh, cerebral palsy? Well, uh, if you read the literature, somewhere between one to four uh, per thousand births, but it is the most common cause of childhood disability in the developed world. And to the right there, you kind of see the varying ways that people can get around or they're are compensating for their uh, movement disorders um, using various uh, either wheelchairs or using other uh, orthotics and, and mobility devices. There's an increase in CP incidence in twins uh, and certainly in triplets. We see that. Uh, the latest figures from the CDC, which came out in, in from, they're from the year 2010, they came out in 2012, one in 30, 345 kids or about three per 100,000. And that's looking at eight-year-olds because that's what this particular study looks at. Uh, over time, increased incidence. Um, and one of the big increases is because modern medicine, um, you know, allows really, really tiny babies to survive in the prenatal period. So very, very small preemies who didn't survive before, and that increases the incidence of CP. Um, we see it more common, much more common in boys than girls. It's more common in black children than white children. Um, most of the patients that you'll see will have spastic CP, so that uh, too much muscle tone and spasticity and sort of the jerky movement. Um, uh, and then we also see that most kids can walk independently, most, you know, 50 to 60%, and that about one in 10 kids um, will walk with something that's just handheld. So with, with either with crutches, um, or they can use a cane. And sometimes we see kids with those little, uh, it's kind of the um, rolling uh, walkers. So what are the risk factors for CP? Well, intrauterine infections, uh, teratogens, um, abdominal trauma, and multiple births. So we know that those are all risk factors in prenatally. Postnatally, um, we see premature birth and low birth weight. And you can see that little tiny baby there and you see that baby's the size of a hand. You can actually hold that baby in your hand. So, you know, uh, you know, even maybe a generation ago, those were not children who would survive, um, but now they are a risk factor for uh, having uh, CP. Associated disorders that we also see, so we see intellectual disability. So about one third of kids will have that have intellectual disability and CP will have a mild impairment and about one third might be moderate to severe. About half of the kids with CP will have seizures. Uh, lots of vision and hearing impairments. We see speech impairments. Um, we see dysphagia, uh, right? So uh, patients who have problems speaking. Failure to thrive, we see hip dislocation and lots of spinal deformities uh, in, in this population. So here's one of our patients and she's sitting in her chair and you can see how busy she is moving because even in a still photograph, she's moving. Um, but one of the things to remember is that only 40% of people with CP also have intellectual disability, which means the majority of people with cerebral palsy do not have an intellectual disability. This is a key takeaway point. Remember that when you meet someone with cerebral palsy that you should not assume that they have an intellectual disability because most people do not. Uh, what kind of oral and dental findings? Again, these malocclusions. We see enamel defects. We see an increased incidence of dental trauma. We see lots of bruxism and we see lots of drooling. So when we see this sort of, uh, which is kind of a typical malocclusion with an anterior open bite, posterior cross bites, uh, that's secondary to the, the hypotonia of the, the uh, facial, facial musculature and the palatal shelves really don't develop and they don't close correctly. And you can also see that the tongue thrust is not helping the matter. So you can see right there that that tongue just really wants to come right out. And so that makes uh, correcting malocclusions very difficult. What else? Well, we see an increased risk for dental caries and periodontal disease. And that's when, when that report, and I have an asterisk there because when you read the articles about that, what it really is talking about is that because of patients who have malocclusions, that often you may see more dental caries. 
That does depend if the patient is being tube fed or not. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we see lots of dental erosion because we see lots of, of GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, lots of GERD in this population. Um, and that can increase the tooth sensitivity because the erosion. Uh, we see delayed eruption of permanent teeth. We see a lot of class two div one malocclusions, um, tongue thrusting, mouth breathing, lots of gag reflex, lots of problems with swallowing, lots of problems with talking, oral hypersensitivity. Um, we may see prolonged and exaggerated bite reflexes. So somebody may uh, be staying open really, really well and stre stretch extra, extra wide and then just snap down. Um, and so we're gonna talk about how to manage that. Uh, we see poor oral hygiene and a lot of that has to do with that. It's, it's um, kind of difficult to get in there. And if you have all those malocleated teeth, that's difficult. And sometimes we see food pouching in this group where people will eat and they'll just keep it in their cheeks. Okay, so that's, that's a problem as well. So oral hygiene is an issue. So why do we have so much trauma? Well, we have problems with balance, muscle weakness in our legs, malocclusions and the seizures. So this is a group that we often see missing front teeth um, or we see they have front teeth, but they're chipped or, uh, and, and we sometimes will say, oh, well, let's just make a bridge. And then you make a, a, one, a three unit bridge and then you make a four unit bridge because they fall and break that. And then you make a six unit bridge. And then you're like, what should I do next? Um, so it becomes a restorative challenge for patients. And one of the things to remember is, you know, what, what is the patient's uh, abilities to maintain this? And we're going to talk about dental treatment and how these things can be managed. A uh, lot of enamel defects um, and lots and lots of, of bruxism. And sometimes, and here you see it's in the primary dentition, sometimes uh, it will actually... Um, as children grow older, we don't see it in the permanent dentition. However, the more impaired an individual is, the more likely are they, they will continue this into adult dentition and adulthood. When we talk about dysphagia and people having, um, uh, so people having problems uh, with their swallowing, right? So patients will have uh, dyscusia or dysphagia where they they have a hearing problem swallowing and they are really struggling. Um, some patients have an inability to swallow. So if the soft palate is not dropping down and it's not uh, closing off, um, uh, if it's not uh, closing off of um, the trachea, that, that's a problem, right? So when we are talking about what we're, we're uh, uh, for, for these patients, we have to really consider how is the patient swallowing? Do they have a good swallow reflex? Um, again, when patients have all this extra drooling, it is not because they have excess saliva. Most patients make between uh, a half a liter and one and a half liters of saliva a day. It is actually because they are not able to swallow their saliva. So now everyone's busy swallowing, right? Yeah, every time I have this, I say, oh, I should swallow. Um, but it's not because there's that, that it's because they don't swallow and they kind of have this forward posture. So it tends to pull and um, the swallowing pattern is what's responsible for the drooling, not because the patient's making so much more saliva than anyone else. Uh, what are our problems when uh, patients have problems swallowing? Well, they are definitely at risk for aspiration pneumonia. So when we're doing restorative, rubber dam and diligent high-speed suction are a must. These days with COVID, we're doing that with everyone. So particularly with this group. Um, and then sometimes patients, because they have such severe dysphagia or they may have aphasia, they will actually have a feeding tube. So we'll uh, show you some pictures of that. Um, the patients who are aware that have feeding tubes, interestingly enough, are not going to get uh, dental caries, but they do get severe calculus deposits. So here's a picture from Eastman, and uh, these show you some typical deposits in patients who have uh, a G-tube or gastric tube. Uh, the calculus may go all the way over the teeth. And I'll show you a picture of that next. So here's a patient on the right that you see. This is what we see a lot. So you see this sort of um, typical case where we have sort of a collapsed upper arch, we see missing anterior teeth, and we see tons and tons of what I always call popcorn calculus because it's like the color of popcorn and it kind of looks like it and it's everywhere. Um, and it's a rapid accumulation 
deregulation of this. Now, these folks all have, this is from somebody who has a feeding tube, and the calculus will just build up and build up and build up. Number one, because they're not swallowing, but number two, they don't have the mechanical action of eating. So they're never, you know, breaking up all of that pellicle around their teeth, and they just get a tremendous amount of calculus. Of course, they're not going to get caries because they don't eat. There's no fermentable carbohydrates. And you might remember that Venn diagram from way back in dental school. And you remember you have to have a host and you have to have bacteria, but you have to have fermentable carbohydrates. And if you don't eat, you won't have any fermentable carbohydrates in your mouth. However, if you have gastric reflux, there may be a possibility that you are refluxing some, some carbohydrates back into your mouth. So it's important to know if the patient has GERD and if it's under control. Now, you don't need to pre-medicate anybody who has an, uh, a gastric tube or if they're being fed through their nose. Um, there's no reason for that. Uh, but when you treat these patients, you should treat them upright, uh, as upright as possible, and use low amounts of water. You definitely need high-speed suction. You definitely need an assistant if you're trying to get this stuff off because you don't want the patient to aspirate it. And the thing that's really interesting is that, um, and this is purely anecdotal, but a lot of special care dentists will tell you this, um, we tend to not take the calculus off of the occlusal surfaces of the teeth because it's like a natural sealant. So if the patient regurges, that's fine. Their teeth are basically sealed. If they don't regurge, also fine. It's, they're not eating, it's not gonna disturb it. What you really wanna do is when you go back and you see this nasty, uh, red inflamed gingiva, you want to get all of that calculus off of the gingiva and let the gingiva heal. It's not harming the occlusal surfaces of the teeth, but it certainly is, is a, a, a nidus for bacteria in the gingiva. So you want to get it off of the gingiva. Um, we did this last time, so we're going to skip that for now. Um, medical treatment. So there's no treatment for, for CP. Uh, we can improve the patient's capabilities. There's early intervention, a lot of supportive treatments use medication, we might use some surgery. Uh, patients will certainly get physical therapy and occupational therapy, speech therapy. They may be on drugs for their seizures. Often we see patients who are on baclofen, which is a common muscle relaxant that is used for patients with CP. Some patients actually will have an inserted, implanted um, baclofen pump that, uh, is, that is always on, which releases a certain amount of baclofen at certain times, sort of just like, a, like an insulin pump, um, so that patients are relaxed and they don't tense up and have spasms. We see lots of braces and other orthotic devices on legs uh, for patients, wheelchairs, and uh, we see a lot of assisted devices. Um, somewhat like you might have remembered the late Stephen Hawking, he had an assistive um, a voice synthesizer, and he would uh, use his eyes to look at the at what he wanted to say, and then it would play. Um, and we have several patients that that have voice synthesizers. Uh, long term medication regimens, lots of high sugar medications, decreased saliva, and we see gingival hyperplasia again due to uh, patients being on dilantin or calcium channel blockers. Um, and so those are also things we have to deal with. One thing we might not think about is, is uh, TMJ disorders and really evaluating our patients with neuromuscular disorders for uh, TMJ disorders. It turns out that patients with CP are really at a higher risk for developing signs and symptoms of TMJ. Uh, there also, we see lots more men. Uh, we see the malocclusion, the mouth breathing. Uh, sometimes we see mixed dentition, right? Because the patient doesn't ha has a delayed eruption or doesn't have eruption of permanent teeth. And when we look at this, we, this is the perfect storm for TMJ disorders. Now, because the patient has so many other things going on, they may not be the person who comes in and complains of their TMJ disorder. So uh, it really behooves us to make sure that we are doing a good TMJ exam on our folks with neuromuscular disorders. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's really important is you must know how this person communicates. Uh, they might use gestures, they might, you know, they might may be able to speak, they may have make nonverbal requests. We have patients who have little boards that they point to. We have assisted you know, um, uh, communication devices. And we may have patients who can speak. You just must be patient. Try not to finish the patient's sentence or guess what they're going to say. 
be patient and listen and let the patient finish their thought. Why? Because we have patients with dysarthria. So in patients with dysarthria, um, they have problems with muscles that control speech and mastication. And it may be very hard for the patient to get that word out, but be respectful and give the patient the dignity to allow them to speak. Just give them time. If you're having trouble understanding the patient, you can ask whoever is with the patient. So if the patient comes with someone else and it's a caregiver or a spouse or a friend, they're more likely to understand what the patient is saying. And you can certainly ask them, hey, do you, can, you, can you help me here? When we're treatment planning, we have to think, what kind of medications is this patient on? How much movement do they have? Uh, do they have a caregiver? Are they doing their own oral hygiene? And, and will they be able to take something in and out of their mouth? Do they have physical barriers? Are they unable to physically uh, brush their own teeth? How will we maintain the dental treatment that we do? Are they gonna be able to cooperate with the treatment? And what about that trauma? Remember we showed those pictures with the trauma. So there's physical limitations, right? Patients might, uh, we might have to make some adaptive hygiene devices. And these are some old slides from the ADA in the 1970s. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about here. You see those uh, nice uh, um, kind of the Y shapes that you can buy commercially. You could make one, but you know, you can buy them. They're pretty cheap um, and they're easier to use on someone else. And they're certainly easier for someone who has problems with, uh, um, you know, physically brushing their own teeth. Uh, nice picture of flossing on the floor. I don't care where you brush teeth or where the patient gets their teeth brushed or their flossing done. Any place that's comfortable for the patient is just fine. So there we have somebody lounging. Uh, it looks like probably it's in the living room and that's fine too. Uh, when we do our dental treatment, think about reclining the wheelchair. So many, many wheelchairs will recline. If the patient's wheelchair reclines and you're only and all you're doing is, you know, an exam or maybe you're doing a profi, you might consider not moving the patient. Um, and sometimes we put a sliding board uh, that we use to transfer patients, we'll just put it right behind the patient's head um, so that they're comfortable. Uh, here in our clinic, because we're specialized, we actually have a wheelchair lift that actually will take a, a, a non-motorized wheelchair and, and tilt it like a dental chair. You have to stand up and deliver the care, but it works pretty well. Uh, you may consider using chlorhexidine uh, or other antimicrobials. Uh, if patients have severe bruxism, um, you might consider making a mouth guard, but a lot of these folks have gagging and it's uncomfortable and they probably may not allow, may not allow that. Um, and again, don't assume that everyone knows how to brush their own teeth. Um, it's sort of something that we do. It's like, I'm trying to remember if anyone ever taught me to brush my teeth. I know that when I went to dental school, I know that Mrs. Panel taught me uh, in hygiene about modified bass technique. And I remember learning all about brushing teeth and showing patients how to brush their teeth, but I'm not sure anybody showed me before that. I think we just think people will know how to do it. So showing people how to brush and floss their own teeth and letting them show you how they do it is a great idea. And you can use models, you can have the patient show you. And if there's a caregiver involved, you can, um, you can show them and have them demonstrate. Patients with CP have these primitive reflexes where when the patient's head, so they have an asymmetric head, uh, um, an asymmetric head, good Lord, asymmetric reflex. When a patient's head is turned, um, the arm and leg on that side stiffen and extend and the other ones flex. So you'll see the patient sort of turn to one way and they stiffen on one side and they flex the other way. Um, and this is a primitive reflex. So the patient can't help doing this. They're not trying to, to not cooperate. They can't help doing this. Um, and also if the patient is laying on their back and everything is extended, they may arch up with their back and their neck and they're not trying to be uncooperative. Again, primitive reflex. Uh, startle reflex, this is really uh, important. Don't surprise a patient with cerebral palsy with lights or noises or anything that's going to uh, surprise them because they, they can have incredibly forceful movements. Um, and that's called the startle reflex, right? It's just like when you jump up when you didn't realize somebody was standing behind you. What can we do about the malocclusion? You know, this open bite and these anterior teeth, and then there's tongue thrusting, and you can see it here in these photographs. Uh, and patients usually cannot close their lips, all right? Because the open bite 
uh, is, is tremendous and they can't close their lips and then they get dry mouth and their mouth breathing. This can also lead to having some um, fungal infections. So you might see bright red gingiva on patients who are mouth breathers. Uh, a lot of times that's, that it's actually fungal. You can try using some topical antifungals. You can start trying using troches or applying antifungals right to the area that may help. Um, for patients who, uh, if you're thinking about doing ortho, uh, for patients who have a really severe uh, open bite, you know, correcting the malocclusion might not be possible because you're always going to be fighting the muscles of mastication. You're always going to be fighting the tongue and, and the oral facial muscles. And they're, they're, they're too strong for ortho. No matter what you do, they will, they will prevail. So um, we have to really consider, is this somebody that we can maintain this in? Um, we have had some patients that we have done orthognathic surgery on, and you have to do that on patients who do not have moderate or severe CP because otherwise, you know, the muscle forces will, will, will um, sort of negate the, the efforts of your surgery. In orthodontic treatment, we also have to consider what is the risk of caries and enamel hypoplasia in the group. Um, and, you know, just because someone has an intellectual disability or a developmental disability, that in and of itself should not be a barrier to ortho treatment. We shouldn't say, well, that patient has autism or CP or seizures or intellectual disability, so they can't have ortho. Uh, that's simply not true. We have many, many ortho patients who have those things. It, and again, in orthodontics, it's always uh, patient selection, right? Should we, should, is this patient a good um, candidate for ortho? And, and, you know, we have lots of patients who don't have developmental disability who aren't a good candidate for ortho, right? Because they're not compliant. Uh, so we have to think about maintaining oral hygiene. We also have to consider that these folks have, uh, often will have flared anteriors, and if we put braces on there, are we going to have a problem with trauma? And so you have to really, really think about what is the best interest of the patient when you're considering doing orthodontics on this group. What about um, drug interactions? There really isn't any local anesthetics aren't really a problem for patients with CP. Um, a lot of the muscle relaxants and the anticholinergics cause CNS depression and uh, and we do use some CNS depressants in dentistry. So, you know, if you're, you're gonna do conscious sedation, you really have to know the patient's medical history. You have to discuss it with their physician because obviously you wanna be careful not to uh, cause too much CNS depression. So that's really where you have to look at it if you're considering any kind of sedation. Um, it's certainly not a problem with local anesthetic. Let's talk about safe dental treatment. Some of the things you can do. Well, uh, with the patient's consent, or obviously the guardian's consent, um, often we use Velcro straps on the patient to hold their head back to the headrest. And we use this um, not so much for treatment, but we do it a lot for x-rays. So if we're trying to get an x-ray, we might do that, or we might do it as long as the patient is comfortable and, and allows it, we may do it. Um, mouth props. I would not do dentistry on a patient with cerebral palsy who has a uh, uh, spastic cerebral palsy without a mouth prop. These patients can suddenly, they'll try and help you. And as they're trying, they kind of overextend their mouth and they overextend it and they overextend it. And then they just clamp shut um, like in a big snap, like a snapping turtle. And uh, it's really scary and you can get very, very hurt. So we don't want that to happen to any, any uh, practitioners or, or office staff. So I always use a mouth prop with patients with cerebral palsy because they have uncontrollable movements um, and we want to be safe. Um, we don't wanna have any sudden movements, again, that can cause spasming. And again, the lights, the sound, anything can get, get them to have the primitive reflexes. So that, that's another reason to always have a mouth prop in. Uh, you can use like a finger guard. So sometimes we'll use a, malt mouth prop or just a, a little of rubber, uh, one of the ones that we use for endo. Uh, we may use one of those with uh, floss on it and I might put my finger in the middle of it to hold it and, and keep my finger in there. I would never put my fingers in, in between the teeth um, without a mouth prop for sure. Uh, we use plastic mirrors in case the patient bites down. We don't want to shatter the glass. And when you're using sharp instruments, you have to be really, really cautious. So someone needs to be uh, controlling the movements of the patient. And often we'll say to the patient, is it okay if we have one of the assistants or if it's a child like your mom or your dad, or if it's a, you know, somebody who has a spouse, can, one, can somebody hold your head while 
while we do the part with the sharp instruments because we don't want to injure you. So, you know, we'll have these discussions um, and we'll make sure that the patient is, is okay with it or the parent is okay with it, the guardian, before we do that. But it, it can be very difficult because the patient's moving around a lot. If I'm just doing an exam, I don't care if the patient's moving around. I'll just, I'll just get myself a nice uh, a finger rest and I'll just look around while the patient's moving around. It's fine. Here's some of the mouth uh, props we use. So we use the open wide, um, which is uh, a foam block with a handle and that can be rinsed off and it can be air dried and can be given to the, to, the, to the patient or the caregiver and it can be used at home for hygiene. Uh, we have the molt mouth prop, which is, looks like a ratchet. I would never use that unless you're trained because you can often get the patient's skin caught in there. And, and if they have a beard, forget it. You're really going to do some damage. So don't use that a lot. Um, but we use the silicone bite blocks and we'll often put those in. And when we use those, we always put floss on them because we don't want anything to go down the patient's throat, right? We don't want to block the airway in any way. But you certainly have to have some sort of mouth prop in um, if you're going to, to have any kind of instruments in a patient with CP's mouth. Uh, special seating and positioning adjustments. So here you see, and this is called a backpack, V-A-C dash P-A-C. And um, they make these actually for, as you can see here, it's a, for, for surgery, right? So that's for positioning people for surgery. And they're like a beanbag chair. And they're soft like a beanbag chair. And then what you do is you take the air out with your high speed suction. And when you take the air out, it becomes firm. And you can see in the photo that it's wrapped around the patient. Uh, we have ones that are about half that size. They're about the size of a regular beanbag chair. And we use those to position patients in the chair. And then once we get the patient in the chair, we won't put it over, say the patient has their right arm that they're moving around uncontrollably. We'll put it over their elbow so that they can still move their arm but that they can't hit one of us so that they still have room. We're not holding them down. We're allowing them to actually continue to move and shake if they want, but they will not be able to, to you know, reach the operator. Um, and again, you don't want people, you don't want to force people into unnatural positions or to, to attempt to stop the uncontrolled body movement. So we restrict the uncontrolled body movement, but we don't force it into one position. We let the patient still move. Uh, we often uh, ask it for assistance from, from uh, the parent or the dental assistant. And with small kids, we often will say to the parent, is it okay if they sit in your lap? Because that might be the safest way to, to render the treatment. As far as sedation and anesthesia, so patients with cerebral palsy and not just children, but patients in general, they might be difficult to handle. And it might not be because the patient's trying not to be cooperative. Uh, they're just really having trouble cooperating. They can't keep still. And you may need to do something like uh, an upper molar, you know, second molar endo. Well, that's going to be pretty tough on a patient if they're awake. So then we might consider doing, you know, sedation or anesthesia. Um, whenever you're going to do that, obviously you need to consult with the patient's physician. You have to consider the patient's history of respiratory difficulties. If the patient has seizures, that can be more of a challenge. Uh, I'm not so concerned with the seizures. Most of the drugs we use for sedation uh, stop seizures. Um, and if the patient were to have a seizure, we still have an IV and we can, we can you know, reverse the seizure. So I'm um, not too concerned with that. You know, I am concerned with the airway. Lots of these patients have difficult airways. Uh, so you may not want to do it in your office. These may be cases that you say, you know what, this is somebody who really needs either uh, outpatient anesthesia in, um, a, a, in, you know, an outpatient center, or they might need it uh, like a surgery center, or they might need to go to the hospital. Again, patients, a lot of these patients tend to have uh, gastroesophageal reflux. And so if they have erosion, their teeth might be really sensitive. Uh, again, sitting the patient upright, um, rather than in a supine position. I, we, we advise our patients to use plain water or baking soda uh, and water to mitigate the effects of their gastric reflux if they're, uh, you know, and we have them rinsing with that. And we all we put them, of course, on a fluoride gel, a rinse or a toothpaste, depending on what the patient can tolerate. Um, and we have them do that every day. Periodontal disease in these patients, we often see poor oral hygiene, um, and sometimes that's not necessarily due to lack of compliance, but it's pretty difficult. I mean, if you think about, it's difficult for me to get into the patient's mouth and I have trained assistants and I'm trained in it, it must be pretty difficult for a caregiver or for a patient. 
Um, we may have complications of oral habits. Certainly the tongue thrusting uh, is a problem. Um, we may have you know, physical abilities and disabilities and limitations. Of course, again, that malocclusion. We might have gingival hyperplasia. And again, gingival hyperplasia is, um, is actually a genetic issue. So if the patient is on a drug that is causing gingival hyperplasia, it's because they actually have the gene that when you take that drug, you get gingival hyperplasia. So no matter what we do, it will not go away unless we can get the neurologist to change the drug or the cardiologist, right? So they might be on a calcium channel blocker. Um, so we can always, you know, work with our, our physician friends and see if we can get those, them weaned off that drug and onto something else, if we can change it. Uh, the one group you can't change it in is um, our patients who have had, uh, are on anti-rejection drugs. And we sometimes see this in, in patients who have kidney transplants, uh, the anti-rejection drugs also have this effect, and obviously you can't change that. The patient has to be on it uh, for life, so then we have to deal with the gingival hyperplasia. Um, power toothbrushes are great. Floss holder, I don't know how you do it without a floss holder. Uh, and we demonstrate sitting or standing positions with caregivers or with spouses, whoever is going to do the toothbrushing, or if it's the patient themselves, I always say to the patient, show me how you brush your teeth at home. Show me how you floss at home, um, because that's going to give me a better idea about the expectations. And again, you can use chlorhexidine. This hyperactive bite and gag, uh, again, I can't emphasize this enough. So patients who have the hyperactive gag reflex means that don't just put something in their mouth really quickly. Uh, you know, tell the patient's coming, move, move things slowly. Uh, don't, don't, you know, kind of surprise them. Use the mouth prop. Uh, we use, we'll have patients come early in the morning before they eat or drink if they have a really severe gag reflex. Um, and again, putting the patient uh, with their chin down, uh, either in a neutral or a downward position, um, this is going to help the patient, number one, not aspirate, number two, not gag. Okay, so that works a lot better. Of course, you can basically not do dentistry sitting down if the patient is sitting upright and has their, their chin down. You pretty much have to stand um, and it can be pretty difficult uh, to, to you know, sort of figure out the ergonomics of that. Um, but you won't get gag reflex and you won't get aspiration and that's the safest way to do it. Uh, trauma and injury. So lots of these folks um, fall. We will re recommend having a tooth saving kit. We have lots of, of group home uh, patients. We say, get that tooth saver. Uh, we tell parents and we tell caregivers have it because if the tooth, permanent tooth gets knocked out, let's make sure we can, we can save it and try and find the pieces of it. Um, another thing that you might uh, consider is that patients who have uh, any kind of, of developmental and particularly an intellectual disability are at a high risk for uh, abuse and a high risk for physical and for sexual abuse. So um, we know this, we know that it's been, it's reported. So you need to be on the alert. If you see some sort of trauma that doesn't make sense to you or the story doesn't seem right, uh, you are a mandated report for this group of patients, uh, uh, just like you are for, for children and, and, and for elderly. So um, you really have to be an advocate for your patients. So you really do need to, you know, does that sound like the real story? Could that really have happened? Um, or, or have we seen the kid come in with multiple traumas? So think about that as well. Uh, medical management, right? So we have medications. Patients are, get, might be on Valium, and that causes excessive drooling. Uh, they are on, it might be on anticonvulsants. And again, gingival hyperplasia, xerostomia, uh, taste changes in taste, right? Discusia, uh, which I think I said incorrectly before, but that is a change in taste. They have stomatitis. Anticholinergics, a lot of these patients are anticholinergics for their drooling. You're going to get xerostomia. You're going to get bruxism. Muscle relaxants like baclofen, xerostomia. So xerostomia, xerostomia, xerostomia. However, most of them are excessively drooling. Um, so it's sort of interesting. Uh, most of the time, you don't see so much xerostomia in these patients. And that's, again, not because they, um, the drugs don't cause that, but because they don't swallow their saliva. Um, Let's talk a little bit about patients with muscular dystrophy. So this is a term for the group of genetic disorders, uh, which involve progressive weakness of your voluntary muscles. Uh, in some cases involve uh, involuntary muscles, but mostly we're talking about voluntary muscles. So the skeletal muscles, muscles of movement. Um, and what are the major types? 
Uh, so the major types are Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right? And that's the one we always kind of think about uh, little boys. Um, it's X-linked recessive. Uh, the second most common one is Becker muscular dystrophy, also X-linked recessive. So you see why we see this more in boys, um, right? So if you have two X's and you are a, a woman and it's recessive, you wouldn't show it, but you're a carrier. Men only have one X, right, being XY. And so because they only have one X, if they have the X uh, for Duchenne's or Becker, it obviously will uh, show up um, in that generation or in that patient. So when we see Duchenne's, and this is a group of kids at a camp for kids who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, the age of onset of that is pretty early, like between ages three and five. Uh, again, X-linked recessive. It's a, it's a defect in a gene that produces a muscle protein called dystrophin. Uh, prenatal testing for this is about 70% accurate. Uh, the, the actual diagnosis once the child is born uh, if there isn't a, you know, if there isn't a familial history, uh, is muscle biopsy. Uh, it's one in about 3,500 live births. Uh, and these folks, these kids always have problems with falling and walking and inability. They certainly can't run. And that's often the first thing that you see. Uh, they get weakness and they get atrophy and it, it's progressive. And you can see it on the right side, the little boy, and he doesn't really have any symptoms. He's young. And then as he gets older, he's got symptoms. And then you certainly get, you know, progressive um, deformities and contractures um, that can be very crippling for patients. Um, patients, these have, patients really usually only survive until late adolescence. Only about 25% will live beyond the age of 25. Um, and death is usually a result of the cardiac com complications, pulmonary infections, or respiratory failures. So in these folks, um, we actually do have a patient who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and he is now 32. So he has lived a very long time. When we met him, he was... Uh, 18. And he said, I don't want to spend any time I have left on the planet coming to the dental clinic and getting my dental stuff done. So I'm not going to get any dental treatment because I'm going to be dead soon. And then at like 20, he showed back up and he's like, apparently I'm not dying. So I guess you have to fix my teeth. And now he really enjoys coming to the clinic. And I think part of that is because he lives in a nursing home now and he's not around other people his age. He doesn't have a peer group there. So he kind of likes to come to the dental clinic. And I think he really likes talking to the, to the residents um, and talking with our students because, you know, he doesn't get out much. And so he'll come in and he'll be like, yeah, I think I have, I have pain. He doesn't really have pain. We're like, we know he doesn't really have pain, but you know what? He can come visit us. Um, we'll do a profi and look around and see how he's doing and make sure everything's okay. Uh, Becker muscular dystrophy, uh, the onset is later around age 10, and the progression is much, much slower. These folks usually will have a normal lifespan, um, and they will, they will be, you know, if they're, they'll, they'll be walking um, well into their 20s. Uh, it's a much more wild, uh, milder form and has a better prognosis. Uh, myotonic dystrophy, we have several patients who have this. It's a most common adult onset form form of muscular dystrophy. Um, you can see it most commonly in like the 20 and 20 year old range, but it can, the onset can be as late as 50. It is slow and progressive. It's autosomal dominant. Okay. So that means that uh, equally affects both sexes and it is a delayed relaxation of the voluntary muscles. We call it myotonia. These folks, unfortunately, also can get cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, pulmonary hypoventilation. Uh, they might have some neuropsychiatric issues, um, and the treatment is purely symptomatic. Um, but they can be stable, and when they're st if they're stable and you discuss it with their, uh, with their medical team, then you can see them in an outpatient setting. Uh, some of the things that are interesting is they will often kind of have these... Uh, um, interesting facies, as we call them, as they get older. So they get like ptosis and they get frontal bossing and they get atrophy of the temporalis muscles, which makes them have some sort of what we call hatchet face. So patients can get other things that uh, kind of a craniofacial almost deformities as a result. Um, so here's the, what happens with the craniofacial morphology and myotonic dystrophy is the patients, um, they get their heads actually get bigger 
Um, they get a bigger angle uh, between their mandibular and palatal planes. They have a longer face. Uh, they're, um, they have narrow faces at their eye and lip level. So the shape of their face starts to change. They'll get an increased palatal vault. So of course, this becomes a problem if we're uh, doing any kind of you know, uh, prosthetics. Uh, the maxillary arch also is narrow. Um, and they, they get increased by zygomatic width and steep mandibles. So these are problems for re restorative, right? So these are not patients that you can think, oh, well, uh, I can put some, some fixed in there. Um, and even if you do removable, you may have to keep um, changing the appliance. So what are the oral facial manifestations of this disorder? Well, patients will have tongue thrusting, they'll have mouth breathing, uh, they have a smaller um, mandibular opening than they used to. They have a lack of retrusive jaw movement. Um, so the earlier onset you have, the more severe your oral manifestations will be. Uh, and they'll have weakness in their muscles of mastication and facial expression. And so sometimes they, they develop severe difficulty in, in chewing and they'll bite their lip a lot. So how can we help these folks uh, from the dental point of view? Well, the first thing you have to do is really do a review of systems with special emphasis on muscular weaknesses. You have to really do a review of systems and find out from the physician what's going on, you know, uh, what other kind of comorbidities do they have? Do they have cardiomyopathies? Do they have respiratory complications? Um, you know, I shouldn't have that in there. That's terrible. I must have taken this. This must be an old slide. We should not use the word mental retardation. We should always use intellectual disability. So shame on me. Uh, I will take my, my, my spanking like a woman in public. It's terrible. I should never use that. I will fix the slide when we're over, when we're done. Um, and consultation with the patient's physician, you should also find out the course of the disease. So how is it progressing? So you need to look at things like pulmonary function tests and EKGs and chest radiographs to look at how fast is the disease progressing and what's the safest venue? Can we treat the patient outpatient or is this somebody who may need to go to a surgery center or the hospital? Um, drug interactions. So again, these folks often are on corticosteroids, which seem to slow the progression of the disease, although they don't cure it. They don't mix well with NSAIDs, which is our favorite thing to give patients for pain. Um, they're often on antiarrhythmics. You know, you have to be very careful with local anesthesia with antiarrhythmics. If they're on tricyclic antidepressants, again, you have to use local anesthetic with caution. Uh, benzos, of course, create xerostomia and sedation. And again, the calcium antagonist we talked about, uh, gingival hyperplasia. So there's lots of drug interactions there. Um, one of the things that we didn't, and I'm going to leave the additional resources slide up, uh, one of the things we didn't talk about was uh, ALS um, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is um, uh, a very difficult you know, um, disease to, to, to work uh, with the patient. Patients often uh, have a short lifespan uh, once they're diagnosed and are not always seeking routine dental treatment. However, again, the same thing. Patients often will have dysarthria and have difficulty speaking. So be, be um, you know, mindful of that and let the patient speak and try and your best to understand them. They may have an assistive talking device, like we talked about Stephen Hawking had one, um, and he lived a great many years, although most people with ALS will only live between uh, three and five years at the most. The five-year survival rate is not good. Um, many patients, uh, by the time they are actually diagnosed, will only live one to three years. So it's not patients that we have to have long-term dental considerations, but again, patients who may need mouth props, patients who need extra uh, attention, patients who need a little more understanding and compassion, uh, certainly patients who are, may need a, a mouth prop and they may need some, uh, you may need some help understanding what they need. Um, those are folks who largely we are just gonna, it's palliative treatment, there's no cure for ALS. Uh, so for, for most patients, we're just keeping them comfortable. Uh, here's a couple fact sheets that you might find uh, online. Uh, the purple one is from the University of Washington. They have oral health fact sheets for dental professionals on just about every kind of special need you can think of. Uh, really, really helpful. You can print them out. You can share them uh, with patients or, your, or people in your practice. Uh, they're free. You can download them. Again, it's at the University of, of Washington. Um, and then there's the practical oral care 
uh, series, which is done by the NIDCR, part of the NIH. And those are all free and they're all online and they come in Spanish, they come with English, and there's a practical oral care for people with just about every um, kind of uh, uh, special need you can think of. And they are very useful. And you can get them, again, you can download those for free at, on the NIH NIDCR website, and you might find those very useful. Uh, a lot of references, and um, I will see hopefully most of you, or and maybe some new friends, when we talk about dental considerations for people with epilepsy and seizures, uh, which is going to be Thursday, February 18th at 6 o'clock Eastern. Again, CE credit will be available. The reg you can use the same registration uh, link that is uh, used today. Uh, if you need to email uh, anybody at Henry Shine regarding the webinars, the email is just webinars at henryshine.com. And with that, Adam, I'm going to send it back to you to see if we have any questions to field. Awesome. Thanks for the great content as always. We've got about 10 minutes left. If anyone has questions, drop them into the Q&A or chat and we'll answer them as we have time. Uh, we've got a couple here. The first one was, what was the device called that you removed the air to make firm? Oh, that's called a VAC pack. And you can look it up. It'll just say V-A-C, P-A-C. Um, it is made by the Olympic Papoose Board Company. They also make Papoose boards. We use those too. Uh, I don't have any financial uh, <laughs> interest in them. They just, they're really the only guys who make them. <laughs> That's some funky names, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, how about using Isolite or Mr. Thirsty? Oh, great question. So we have Isolites and Isodries in the clinic. And yes, as long, uh, or a Mr. Thirsty, as long as it's got a, a bite prop, uh, you know, a, a mouth prop, uh, any of those devices will work. Um, they, the important thing there is that even if you have them, you, you know, you have to see if the patient's comfortable with it. Um, I found that, you know, they don't work so well with patients who have gag reflexes. Uh, so, you know, trial and error, but those are great, great things. I should add those in. Thanks for that. And then uh, the only other question I have right now is any tips for taking impressions on patients with movement disorders? Yeah. So... Don't use a hydrophobic material, <laughs> only use hydrophilic stuff, right? So PBS, uh, um, using, uh, we often, I'll use something that's a, a, a quick set, you know, I will not use something that I think is gonna take too long to set. So sometimes I'll use like putty and I'll just get it in there really fast. Uh, um, I will also, uh, if we can, I will scan a patient. Uh, the problem with the scanning is we get too many bubbles, right? So on the upper, you might be able to scan with a trios or some other kind of scanner. Uh, on the lower, it's really hard. If we're making devices, like if I'm doing something and it uh, doesn't have to be that um, precise, then I will definitely go with alginate. Okay, um, I'll go with some alginate and 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 uh, some some uh, one of my assistants will will mix it up and I'll get it almost ready set and then put it in. Um, so whatever it is, it's technique, you know, you don't want to go with something that's going to take five minutes to set. You're not going to get five minutes. And again, when I put the tray in the patient's mouth, um, I never put my fingers on the occlusal surface for patients with CP because uh, that's dangerous. <laughs> so I'll put my patient, my, 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 my uh, fingers sort of in a U around the, the tray. So holding the, the, um, actual uh, handle of the tray with my thumbs, holding it down and putting pressure on the sides of the tray to hold it down, say in the, man in the mandible. Um, and I'll hold it there and I'll let the patient move around and I'll move around with the patient. I won't try to keep the patient still. I'll just try to keep the tray seated. Um, and that has, has worked out. I have taken um, impressions on patients who um, wanted to stand up <laughs> I've taken patients, uh, impressions on patients who wanted to sit in the waiting room. You know, I kind of have to, you have to kind of go with it. Um, and for getting, you know, for patients who are moving a lot, you kind of just have to go with them. If they're moving to the right, go to the right, you know, keeping your finger rests in there. And that's the best advice I can give you on that. Great advice at that. Um, how do you think a person with CP would deal with a Herbst appliance, orthodontic appliance? Oh, a Herbst. Well, you know, I've never met a patient who really likes their Herbst. Maybe you have different patients, um, but it could be done. It could be done depending on the muscles of mastication and how 
affected the patient is. Um, you know, we see patients with all different ranges of CP. Some patients are mildly affected. Um, some patients, it really, they don't really have oral facial grimacing or movements. It would work on a patient like that. Um, if the patient, you know, really has like hemiplegia and they're not moving around so much, yeah. So I think you look at the patient and you say, you know, if you're willing to try it, we'll be willing to try it. Um, you know, it's sort of one of these things where you have to consider the the muscles and well, will you get what you're looking for? Or are you really, if you're going really up against muscles that are constantly moving, your herpes probably isn't going to do a whole lot. Um, we have done, uh, like I said, successfully, we have expanded palates successfully on patients with CP who didn't have major tongue thrusting, um, who didn't have major open bites, uh, but we have been able to do that. So uh, again, case selection, but I wouldn't say that you shouldn't try it. Um, if the patient, if you think the patient might tolerate it, then, you know, try it. They may. Is there a way to get a pano or cone beam on a patient with a movement disorder? Um, yeah. Yes and no. <laughs> Let me say this. Um, I'm older now and less concerned about my own uh, health and safety. So I often go in the digital Panorex with my patients and I will hold patients on their shoulders, you know, kind of hold them around their torso and their shoulders and duck down and see if we can get the patient to stay in um, long enough to get a reasonable uh, a Panorex. Um, the CT, we haven't been able to really do that in the CT because you can't really go in there with the patient. We also have parents or spouses who are willing to go in there. And of course, we shield everyone who has to go in right to the radio, but it's all digital radiography. So we're not, you know, as, as concerned as we were when we were using traditional radiographs. Uh, but the only way to do that, you know, when we get, if, if we really need great radiographs because we're doing endo or uh, we, we have to do some sort of surgery and we need a good radiograph, then, then yeah, the patient probably has to be sedated. Um, if the patient has a large protocol, we will sedate the patient. The first, you know, we will sedate them to get a baseline and get all of the radiographs. Um, doing the radiographs, even in, you know, using, trying to get bite wings, which are really hard and almost never that useful in this population. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll, uh, is, is one of us will actually hold the, you know, will actually hold the ring and then my assistant will shoot. And again, we'll all get, um, we can, you can ask a parent, you can ask a caregiver if they'll hold it. Um, but I find that in the end, as long as I'm shielded, the patient shielded, my assistant shielded, uh, we'll often do the, the radiographs where we're holding the, you know, the, the XCP ring. Uh, one of us is holding it and the other one is shooting. Again, we use, um, we do have wall mounted x-rays here, but we almost always use um, our nomads. So we can get to the angle we need for our people, people with special needs. Excellent. Thank you for that. I do just want to remind everyone that if you did elect to receive CE credit for today's webinar, it's required that you complete the survey upon exiting tonight. I would like to thank Dr. Perry for sharing her time with us today and presenting. And of course, thanks to all of you for attending. If anyone does have any additional questions regarding CE or anything we covered in this webinar series, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Thank you all again, once again, for joining us tonight, and hopefully we'll see you back here for part four in one month. Thanks, everybody.